Hi, and welcome to the first part of the poem, Out of the Bag. So um, I'm gonna break this poem down into different parts because otherwise it's quite long. So this, this video is just gonna deal with part one of the poem. So first of all, the title, Out of the Bag. Um, like lots of the poems in the collection, it can have two different meanings. The first one, um, it's literally referring to the doctor, who's, who's the focus of this poem, um, and what comes out of his bag, out of his medical bag. Um, but it can also be interpreted as kind of being similar to the phrase, who let the cat out of the bag, meaning kind of who revealed the information. So like lots of the poems, it's got that double meaning. As always, these PowerPoints will be loaded to the um, portal, so you can have a look at the, the annotations as well. But let's have a look at the poem. So it starts, all of us came in, in Dr. Colonel's bag. So we've got this opening sentence, end stop at the end of the line, very direct, um, very simplistic, very factual. All of us came in Dr. Curlin's bag. And this kind of um, refers to the idea that we've got a childlike narrator here, um, a childlike perspective. And that child doesn't fully understand how children come into the world. What they understand is when the doctor arrives with his bag, um, when he leaves, there's a baby. So the logical conclusion is that the baby must have been in the doctor's bag and therefore that's how all of us arrived. We came in Dr. Colonel's bag, Colonel's bag. He'd arrived with it, disappeared to the room, and by the time he'd reappear to wash those nosy, rosy, big soft hands of his in the slurry basin, it's lined in size, the colour of a spangles inside look, goes on to start talking about the bag itself. But the idea being that when the doctor comes back from washing his hands, the bag is empty. There's no baby in there anymore because the baby has been born. Um, so the baby's come out of the bag and that's why all of us came in Dr. Kernan's bag. The idea of the childlike voice, the childlike narrative, you can see continuing in this stanza with the internal rhyme, nosy and rosy. Um, and also the adjectives used, the other adjectives used to describe Dr. Kernan big, soft hands. Perhaps the hands seem big because the child is, is small, or perhaps he is a big man. The fact that you've got the adjective soft perhaps suggests that this is not a threatening doctor, this is a genteel man. Um, and then again, making it clear that this is the, the voice of a child, we've got the childlike comparisons. So because a child will have limited knowledge of the world and limited vocabulary, when it attempts to use um, you know, a simile or a metaphor, then it has to draw on that very limited knowledge. And so the colour of the lined insides of the bag to this narrator are the colour of a spaniel, because a spaniel is, is what they know is that colour. So we've got the bag being empty for all to see. Still talking about the bag and now personifying it, the trap sprung, sprung mouth and snibbed and gaping wide. So we've got the bag being personified. Interesting perhaps that we've got the, um, the personification of a trap. So a trap, we think about kind of um, with animals, trapping animals, sneering animals. So it kind of places this poem in a kind of rural, remote landscape. And Seamus Heaney, the poet himself, grew up in that setting. And, and it's very likely this is a biographical poem. Seamus Heaney was the oldest um, of all the children in his family, and he would have seen the children being born one after another. Um, and said it, a rural, remote countryside background. So perhaps the language here as well is the language that that young child is familiar with. Then we've got the full stop to show the kind of uh, ending of that kind of imagery with the spaniel and the trap. And now also though, still childlike Im imagery, but very different sort of imagery. Now we've got the idea of the doctor being like a hypnotist. So almost like the doctor is, is magical, he's quite special perhaps. Um, here, unwinding us, he'd wind the instruments, this is him packing away, he'd wind the instruments back into their lining, tie the cloth like an apron, so the simile again this time, very domestic, very simple, perhaps the language that the child is familiar with, has perhaps seen their mother wearing an apron and, and that's the only thing they can think about to connect in terms of what it looks like when they tie it, like an apron, round itself, darken the door and leave. 
Now, darken the door is interesting because, again, it's another idiom to darken someone's door or colloquial phrase, like the idiom at the start of the poem, out of the bag, who let the cat out of the bag. But to darken someone's door is usually just to bring bad news or to be an unwelcome visitor. And perhaps the poet has used it here quite deliberately to show the child's misunderstanding of things, the, the child's lack of knowledge of things. They, they don't understand how ch children are, are born. They think they come in the doctor's bag and, and they don't really understand all of the language that they're using. So the dark and the door is perhaps deliberately here to kind of be um, a, unusual, I suppose. OK, so dark and the door. I mean, you can, you can think about it in other ways. You can interpret it further. Is there perhaps a sense of... Uh, doom or foreboding with this doctor darkening the door is actually the children that he's going to go on to bring into the life are they going to cause problems is it going to be a drain on the, res the resources of this family is having a big family you know Haney coming from a catholic family um he's the oldest of, of nine siblings is that actually going to cause some darkness in these lives uh, or alternatively, is it just that when the doctor approaches the door, if we if we get sense that he is this big man from these big hands that he's got, and later it mentions him stooping, so maybe he's he's a big man who's going to stoop over when he walks, maybe um, him darkening the door is because when he goes to the door, he fills the whole door, he blocks out the light, and so he is literally darkening the place. And maybe the child thinks that what that's what that phrase means to darken the door. Um, or is it the shadow of the man as he approaches the door? Is it just quite a literal interpretation that they're not really understanding the phrasing there? So when he's got his bag in his hand as he's leaving, a plump arc by the keel, so just, just describing the shape of the bag. Perhaps there's a bit of a, a confusion from the child. Why does the bag still look round and plump when there's no baby, no baby in it? The baby's just been brought here, so what's filling the bag? Um, We've got the ellipsis then, which kind of creates a bit of a pause and suggests that some time is um, lapsing here before until the next time he came. So the idea that this is a this is a cycle, this is continuous, that the doctor will come and deliver more babies in the future. And in he'd come in his fur lined collar that was also spaniel coloured. So we get some sense of what the doctor is wearing. He's got a fur lined collar. Um, the fact that he's wearing fur, usually we sort of connote fur with being quite um, a rich fabric worn by wealthy people. So perhaps it's to, to connote his wealth, his status as a professional man. Um, but I suppose as well, the fact that he is wearing something made of fur, which, you know, an animal would have been killed in order to get that fur. He's, he's wearing a sign of death and yet he's bringing life into the room. So perhaps like there is in lots of the poems, there's a kind of juxtaposition of ideas uh, and, and thinking about that kind of cycle of life and death. So this doctor who's here, who's bringing life into the room is also wearing something which is associated with death. So we've got that different, uh, different interpretations there. Again, we get the repetition of the spaniel. Um, so that's further emphasizing perhaps the limits of this child, his, his vocabulary, um, the limits of his knowledge. You can only compare to a spaniel. It's a spaniel color. That's the only color I know which is the same um, as, the, as the fur lining of the coat. Okay, and now it goes on to talk about, so when the doctor does return in the future, and I mentioned this earlier, he goes stooping up to the room again. So perhaps if he's a big man, he's, he's, he's stooping as he walks, uh, maybe he's a duck as, it, as he walks, or he's just it's, it's struggled to carry so much weight. Um, but also that verb stooping can suggest a kind of boredom and monotony, perhaps. But this is a bit of a struggle, a bit of an effort, which can completely contrast the idea that, that the doctor is here to do something wonderful, but to deliver a baby. Um, we get the use of again. So again, this idea that this is a this is re repetitive. It's a cycle that he's coming here to deliver more than one child, or not at the same time, but over a course of time. And then we get some more of the childlike vocabulary. Perhaps the smell is described as a whiff and quite colloquial again. A whiff of uh, disinfectant, a Dutch interior gleam of waistcoat, satin, and highlights on the forcep. So we get more contrasting imagery in this stanza. We get the contrasting language, first of all, the, the childlike whiff versus, you know, a complex word like interior, perhaps, or the medical language of the forceps and disinfectant. 
So I suppose because inevitably in lots of these poems, even when you've got a childlike speaker, you've got an adult poet. And so there's a tension sometimes between that simple childlike vocab and then the more adult poetic language. We get more indication of the doctor's dress, this time his satin waistcoat. Um, again, a rich, like, luxurious fabric, um, suggesting, again, this kind of refined gentleman, perhaps quite a dignified gentleman, smartly dressed, lots of status. Um, and I guess you get the contrast as well between things like the disinfectant um, and the forceps and the highlights and the gleam. So there's a kind of juxtaposition between what is something beautiful and wonderful here, um, somebody giving birth, and also the kind of mechanics of that and, and the medical and scientific language of that as well. Okay, just hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, moving on to the next part. Um, the, the, the narrator now starts to talk about the kind of the practical steps of this delivery and how the family became involved. One really important job is getting the water ready. That was next. Not plumping hot and not lukewarm, but soft, sudluscious, saved for him from the rain butt. So water often in literature is kind of synonymous with being life-giving and, 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 and really purposely here because this poem is about giving life. It's about well, this, this first part of the poem at least is about giving life, giving birth. So we've got that image of water. But then if we look at the way that the water is described, soft, sudluscious, saved. So you get that sibilant sound, that repetition of the S, sounds very soothing, very gentle. It's drawing our attention to, to these words and therefore the importance of, of the water and its life-giving properties. Um, it's soft as well, that adjective soft, it's the second time we've had it in the poem perhaps trying to kind of uh, hint at us at how fragile a new ball is, how delicate it is, how it needs to be carefully looked after and tended to. Sud lusher, so it's full of soap suds, this soapy water, so it's the image of kind of cleaning and cleansing, and that's what this water is going to be used for. Um, and also how important and valuable this water is, saved for him, the family being saved in this water, from the rain butt, and it's really interesting that this water comes from the rain butt. So they've collected all the rain water, and that makes it sound much more natural. And I suppose refers to the idea of giving birth as being this really, really natural process. And it goes reminds us again of the kind of cyclical nature. It's the it's the rain water that's come down that's been used at the start of this child's life. Um, so really, really beautiful, natural, poetic image, I think there. And the water then is savoured by him afterwards. So we've had the water saved for him, and now how he savours it afterwards. So obviously to savour something is to, to greatly appreciate something. So he appreciates this water that uh, has been given to him, and he uses it to, to clean himself as well as, as after cleaning the baby. Deliberately, I suppose the word savoured sounds like saviour as well, so it's got kind of biblical connotations like as if the doctor is a saviour to this family or, or is really at least very important, very special, like a biblical figure in this family's life. All thanks denied. So, you know, when they're thanking him so much for, for coming and helping and delivering the baby, he denies that. So suggests that perhaps he's quite a modest fellow, uh, quite humble. Um, you know, Caesar suggests his job. This is nothing particularly extraordinary for the doctor, although it's very, very extraordinary to, to us as he toweled hard and fast. So now we've got a real contrast between that soft language that we just had and that sibilant sound that we just had, and here the kind of um, perfunctory behavior of the doctor that he will just dry um, you know, quickly um, and not particularly delicately as well. And then we've got a comma here, which creates a pause. And it's quite important here because then it go, moves on to talk about sort of the doctor exiting again, then held his arms out suddenly behind him. So the doctor is preparing to leave. He's putting his arms back so that someone else will help him to put on his coat before he leaves. And it's interesting then the, the verb that's used of this person putting on his, his coat. So he held his, out, held his arms out suddenly 
to be squired. So to have his coat put on him like he is a gentleman, like he is um, very kind of upper class and stately. And silk lined into the camel coat. And again, we get another reference as well to the material of the clothing that he's, that he's wearing. So we've had fur, we've had satin, and now we've got silk. So again, that, that wealth, that status, that importance of the doctor is conveyed to us. Then we've got the end stop here, which is quite important because we get a sort of a slight shift in the poem. It becomes less about the doctor and a bit more about the narrator and what they see in their perceptions of things. At which point he once turned his eyes upon me, Hyperborean beyond the north wind blue. So the physical description of the doctor who at once turns, looks at the child who's kind of peering through the holes in the doors Two peepholes to the locked room I saw into. Every time his name is mentioned, skimmed milk and ice, swabbed porcelain, the white. So it starts to then reflect on kind of the things that the narrator associates with the doctor's visit. It, it starts a list of the things, the milk, the ice, the porcelain. Um, and I suppose on this stanza, milk, porcelain, images of kind of white, purity, innocence, but then as the list continues onto the next stanza, it becomes more, more harsh and more clinical. And, and the language actually seems more synonymous with perhaps a butcher shop than it does um, delivering a baby. Although you know, the point being that it, it's the reality of childbirth is that it's bloody and that it's brutal. And so we get the chill of tiles, steel hooks, chrome surgery tools and blood droops in the sawdust. So droops is kind of uh, drops, but in a sort of Irish uh, accent and you can see that you know the cold harsher language and imagery the cold the chill the steel the chrome and the hooks you know say so much much more synonymous with the butchers perhaps and you know Heaney's father um, was interesting in, in in buying cattle so some of the language perhaps that he associated or, or was familiar with growing up maybe comes through in this poem here um, and then we get, though, this full stop in the middle of this third line, uh, which is really important because then it focuses us on, on kind of the final image of the poem, which is that child, that baby uh, that's being born and overhead. So kind of looking up beyond all that is this, is this miraculous um, baby. The little pendant, teetude infant part, strung neatly from a line up near the ceiling, a toe, a foot and shin, an arm, a cock bit like the rosebud in his buttonhole. So the list continues, but now it's the listing of kind of uh, the baby, what he sees through his two peepholes, the different body parts that, that they can see. And it's a very honest, frank account, you know, the, the, the reference to the, the baby's genitalia, and then the final comparison, which on a line on its own to make it really stand out. But again, linking to the idea that this child has a, has a bit limited um, vocabulary and knowledge of the world, when they're comparing the child's genitalia, what it looks like to them is the ros rosebud in the doctor's buttonhole. So it's quite a humorous, um, joyful, lasting line of the poem, really. And obviously it stands out because it is on its own there. So that essentially is part one of the poem. Um, and then I'll do another video for part two of the poem. Okay, hope you enjoyed.